In this way, then, the session broke up. When he returned home, Dionysius, like the sensible, educated man he was, spoke to his wife in the most convincing way possible in the circumstances, explaining everything tactfully and gently. For all that, Calor Ho could not refrain from weeping as she heard the story. At the mention of Charias, she burst into a flood of tears and spoke bitter words about this trial. Oh, she cried, that was all I needed in my misfortunes, to be taken to court. I have died and been buried. I have been stolen from my tomb. I have been sold into slavery. And now, fortune, on top of that, I find myself on trial. You are not satisfied with traducing me to Charius. You have led Dionysius to suspect me of adultery. The first time, your slander led me to the tomb. Now it brings me to the royal court of justice. Asia and Europe tell tales about me. How can I face my judge? What must I hear about me? Treacherous beauty given me, to me by nature for one purpose only, that I be overwhelmed by slanders against me. Hermocrates' daughter is on trial and does not have her father to defend her. When other people go into court, they pray for goodwill and kindness. What I am afraid of is finding favor with the judge. She spent the whole day lamenting despondently to herself like this. Dionysius was in even worse state. When it came night, she had a dream. She saw herself in Syracuse, entering Aphrodite's shrine, still a maiden. Then returning from there, and seeing Charius and her wedding day. She saw Syracuse all decked out with garlands, and herself being escorted by her father and mother to the bridegroom's house. She was on the point of embracing Charius when she suddenly started up from her dream, she called Planjon. Dionysius had got up before her to rehearse for the trial and told her about the dream. Planjon replied, Take courage, madam. You should be glad. That is a good dream that you have had. You will be freed from all your worries. What you dreamed is what will happen in reality. Go off to the king's courtroom as if it were Aphrodite's temple. Recall your real self and recover the beauty you had on your wedding day. As she was speaking, she began to dress Calerho and make her beautiful. And Calerho instinctively felt cheerful, as if divining what was to come. Well, the next morning, the crowd milled about the palace. The streets were packed, overflowing the city. Everybody was crowding together, ostensibly to hear the trial, but in fact to see Calerho and Calerho surpassed herself in beauty as much as she had earlier surpassed the other women. So she entered the courtroom looking like Helen when the divine Homer describes her as appearing among the elders, around Priam and Panthus and Thymoides. Her appearance produced stunned astonishment and silence. Everyone prayed to lie in bed beside her. If Mithridates had had to speak first, he would have been unable to utter a word. It was as if, on top of the wound he had already received at Love's hand, he had now been struck another blow even more violent than his original passion. Dionysius began his speech as follows. Sir, I am grateful to you for according respect to me, to virtuous behavior and to the institution of marriage. You would not allow a private individual to be the victim of a governor's intriguing. You summoned him here in order to punish wanton and arrogant behavior as it has affected me, and to forestall it as it may affect others. And the offense deserves punishment all the heavier for the culprit being who he is. It is Mithridates, not my enemy, but my guest and my friend who has designs against me. And he aims not just at some other possession, but at what is most precious to me than body and soul, my wife. This is a man who, 
Had anyone else offended against me, ought himself to have come to my assistance. If not for my sake, who am his friend, then for your sake, who are the king? For you put in his hands the highest office. In proving unworthy of it, he has brought shame on you. Nay, he has betrayed him who entrusts him with that office. I'm well aware that I cannot rival Mithridates in groveling or in power and resources he is deploying in this suit. But I have confidence in your justice, sir, and in the institution of marriage, and in the law whose integrity you preserve for all alike. If you are going to acquit him, it would have been much better never to summon him here in the first place, because in that case, all would have been in fear and trembling, knowing that wanton behavior would be punished if brought to judgment. But now people who are brought to judgment and not punished will feel contempt. My case is clear and brief. I am the husband of Callerho here, present, and already a father by her. She was not a virgin when I married her. She had been married before to a man called Charius, long since dead. In fact, his tomb is in Miletus. Now, Mithridates came to Miletus and saw my wife in the course of normal hospitality. Thereafter, he behaved neither as a friend nor as a man of restraint and decency, such as you require in those entrusted with the government of your cities. Rather, he showed himself wanton and lawless. Knowing my wife to be chaste and loyal to her husband, he judged her impervious to words or gifts, and he devised what he thought would be a very convincing means of advancing his designs. What he did was pretend that her former husband, Charius, was alive. He forged a letter in his name and sent it to Callerho by means of slaves. But fortune appointed a king worthy of the name, and the providence of the other gods brought the letters to light. Bias, the governor of Rimi, sent the slaves and letters to me. I discovered the plot and reported it to Pharnaces, the satrap of Lydia, and he reported it to you. I've told you the story of the matter you were judging. My argument is incontrovertible. Either Charius is alive, or Mithridates is guilty of adulterous intent. No other conclusion is possible. He cannot even say he did not know Charius was dead. He was in Miletus when we erected his tomb. He joined us in mourning him. No, when Mithridates wants to commit adultery, he resuscitates the dead. I close by reading the letter he sent by his own slaves to Miletus from Caria. Take it and read it. From Charius, I am alive. If Mathradides can prove that, he should be acquitted. But think, sir, what a shameless adulterer it is who even tells lies about a dead man. Dionysius' speech aroused his audience. They were on his side at once. The king was moved to anger and looked at Mithridates in a threatening, ominous way. Well... Mithridates showed no sign of distress.